even if things are very impressive and miraculous for us, Jesus doesn't talk about it like that, like a miracle, like a sign. It's a sign for us, a miracle, it's a miracle for us. But Jesus talks it simply about, like, that's my job. That's what I do. Uh, that's normal. <laughs> I mean, for God, there's nothing exceptional in these things. And now we need to keep that in mind, and that's what we have here. So let's read, and you'll see that. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Already, that's pretty uh, significant uh, condition there. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You notice, in fact, that I just want to notice that uh, our rabbi, from which we have the word rabbi, actually is really exclusively basically used of Jesus in, in the Gospels. And it means my master. That I at the end is the my, the, per, the per person. It's my teacher, my master. It's really a high title. It's not just teacher. It's much more than that. But let's just go with that. Jesus answers, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. There's a lot to say about this, how people believe that these people were handicapped or born blind. It's because of some sin, uh, of something wrong. And also to remember that even in Judaism at the time, especially among the Sadducees, there was a belief in reincarnation uh, because that came from the Greeks. Plato believed in reincarnation. Uh, that the, the, the Sadducees inherited some of that thinking. But I want to go into that. <laughs> Th it's another subject. But <laughs> they believe that, some of the Jews. So we must, now here's what Jesus says that's interesting. Notice this. For, for first of all, he begins, he doesn't say, I must work. He says, we. So already when Jesus talks about what he's going to do with we, and he does that a lot, then we begin to, we begin to realize that he's going back, he, John is going back to the beginning of the gospel, where he, where he begins with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. So you have a we here. You have a they here. You have, you have God, you have the Father and the Son being one. In fact, that is mentioned, in fact, I dare one. The Father and I, we are one. So he says we, so he's pointing not just to himself, he's pointing to God, to the Father. And of course we know there's the Father, the Son, the Spirit. I mean, that's very clear in the New Testament. So we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. So Jesus is not just somebody who was born on earth from a mother and father, like any human being. He was sent. Uh, he was sent from somewhere else. So he pre-exists his birth. That's important. And that's always been a very big question uh, for people from the beginning. How can... How can it pre-exist? Well, there's two theories on that. There is, I think, the biblical view, which is that he's eternal. He's divine. The other theory, which many have adopted, is that he was created at some point. He's not divine. Well, we, we don't believe that, but that's a very common belief uh, among a number of people. So he says, we must work the works of him. Notice that here, what he's going to do we would call a miracle or a sign, but what does Jesus call it? A work. A work is nothing exceptional. There's nothing exceptional for God to be able to do that because God can do anything he wants. <laughs> he has all power over everything. It's not like it's really hard for God. He's going to have to muster, you know, a lot of energy, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, for God, it's not hard. But for us, things are hard, not for God because he's all-powerful. So that's very important. Now, we must work the works of him uh, who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. It's translated actually by John, which is good. So he went and washed and came back seeing. All of that, uh, which is quite amazing, quite, quite extraordinary. The man was born blind. Now he's going to see perfectly. Like I said, that's just the work of God. So what, I, what I want us to do is go through the gospel and see how often this concept comes uh, that, we, that we meet here, this concept of I'm doing the work of God. 
Just like God can do this, I'm doing. So let's look at that. Uh, let's look, at, for example, um, in chapter uh, 6. If we go back, and we're going to go back, chapter 6. And uh, this is the, the uh, multiplication of, of the bread. Huh? Verse 30. So in verse 30, we have this also this miracle uh, that we have here. So they say to him, what sign do you do that we must see and believe you, that we may see and believe? And then notice, what work do you perform? Uh, this idea of work here. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, it is written, he gave them bread for heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they say to him, Sir, give us this bread always. This is just part of uh, something God is doing himself. Uh, and more amazing for us, but for God, he's just doing it because that's, that's part of his nature. Uh, chapter 5, verse 16, if we go back. Verse 16. This was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And notice something about the Sabbath. Was the Sabbath given to, to men or was it given to God? Was God, did God have to rest on the Sabbath? Is the, I mean, we take the Ten Commandments, that's something that's funny, fu funny to look at. Could, can we really take the Ten Commandments and say, this applies to God? <laughs> we can't. Uh, when it says, you know, did God, does God have a law that he has to rest? In fact, n not only that, but it's impossible for God to rest on the Sabbath. Because if God rested on the Sabbath, what would happen? Everything would fall apart. Because he maintains everything. Uh, things continue to happen. Life continues to be there. I mean, people continue to live and breathe. There's still air and all of that on the Sabbath. Now, if, if that's true for God, then what about the Messiah? Now, the Messiah is a man, but he's divine. So as a man, as a Jew, he's keeping the Sabbath as it should be kept. He never breaks the Sabbath, really. He breaks the tradition about the Sabbath. But as God, as divine, and that's he's trying to show, he's not just a rabbi, he's not just a but he is divine. That's what John wants to show from the beginning. He's the Logos. He's going to perform things. He's going to do things uh, on, on the day of the Sabbath. But what does he say? Just like Jesus, just like God, my Father is working until now, and I am working. So when he heals the, uh, the officer's son there, he's, he's doing something that God does all the time. God gives life. God heals, God provides food every day of the week, <laughs> all the time. So that's what we see here. You notice this idea then of work. Let's look at chapter 4. We go back a little bit, 30, verse 34. So again, this is the same uh, con context here uh, that we have about the... Um, the woman of Sam uh, the woman of Samaria, uh, the discussion here. Uh, so, what does he say in verse of uh, thirty-four? Uh, he's talking to his disciples. Jesus says to them, "My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work." Uh, Jesus is accomplishing His work in a very unique way. What is the work of God? Well, it's to bring life. First, it's to create, to sustain life, to bring about life, to make all things possible. Part of that can be healing also. All of that that's happening, that's the work of God. And that's the work that God does that we really can't do. There are things we can do as human beings, but we can't do what God can do. You know, we, we need God to help us survive and live and all of that. Well, Christ puts himself here at that level, which through these signs, uh, through the things he's doing, he's showing 
what he says later on, he who has seen me has seen the Father. I'm doing something that is normal for God. It may be a miraculous for you. It's incredible for you, but I'm just doing the God's work. And he could have done tons more if he wanted to. He could have healed everybody if he wanted to. There's no problem with that. But the reason he does these things is to show who he is and the consequences of that. So let's look again, let's look again in chapter 3. You notice then, uh, you, if you begin to notice the importance of this concept of the works of God, what God is accomplishing, I am accomplishing too. Well, my father and I are accomplishing. Chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these things, uh, these signs that you do, unless God is with him. Notice, no one can do what you're doing unless God is with him. With him. Not just helping, but with him. Uh, what Jesus is doing, only somebody who is close to God, connected to God, can do these things. I, it's more than, any, than anything else that we, we've ever seen in, in, the whole, in the whole Old Testament, even. Uh, we can look at a few other passages, even chapter 5, I forgot, I think chapter 5, verse 19. Let's look at 519. We have something here. Yes. 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 I think Nicodemus had faith because uh, he he's, he's expresses some kind of faith, some level of faith, because he says no one can do these things unless God is with him. So he's recognizing, of course, he becomes a Christian later on, a disciple. Uh, Nicodemus, uh, as some of the members of the Sanhedrin, you know, were converted. But I think that he's, uh, he's, he's uh, at a point of faith uh, to be able to call him, you know, like, like the apostles would call him later on, uh, Rabbi, my master. Uh, it is pretty amazing. It's it's kind of stunning that he would do that. The what? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, it's not just about Jesus, but Jesus connects what he's doing with, with God, the action of God. That's what I'm trying to show here, that the work, the things that Jesus is doing, <laughs> they're not even miracles and signs. They're just, they're just, in a very more general way, the work of God. For me, they're normal, basically. They're natural, uh, we would say. God, do this kind, God does this kind of thing. And God doesn't call it miraculous. There's no miracle for God. It's only a miracle for us. <laughs> you know, God is, there's no miracle. There's nothing that impresses God. It impresses us, of course. All right, uh, let's go to chapter 1. We, we're going back to the beginning. We've got something here. It's not 49 and 50 with Nathaniel. And here again, I think we have a reference to this idea of the work, the works, the things that Jesus does. So Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. <laughs> what a confession. From the beginning of the gospel, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. Of course, it means the same thing. Huh? Son of God and king of Israel is exactly the, the same person, the Messiah. Jesus answers, because I say to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe, you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open." and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, another title for the Messiah. So you will see greater things than these. Uh, all he saw was that Jesus knew him as he was under the fig tree. How did he do that? Well, of course he knew. So that's what we have, that's what we have here. Uh, chapter 1, verse 33. Let's see what we have here. 
yes, is important here also, the work of Jesus, the work of the Messiah. Uh, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with the water said to me, so he's John the Baptist, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now here is a unique work that normally can only be the work of God, is the work of the Messiah. I mean, who can, who can baptize somebody, who can give to somebody the Holy Spirit? It's not God. Can a prophet do that? Could Moses do that? Could the prophets do that? Nobody could. Uh, and it's not, even, it's not even like, I mean, all the prophets, they're not that many, but the prophets who perform miracles, it was a gift they received from God, a power they received from God. But here, this one, <laughs> he, he gives the Holy Spirit. He baptizes. He immerses people uh, in the Holy Spirit. Now, only God can do that. So again, that's a work of Jesus. You know, that that's the work of, of the Messiah. All right, so that's, I think that's interesting to see that in this, uh, in this context. Uh, to see that when he's healing this blind man, they have to see in the work of Jesus, they have to see through that work of Jesus more than just a teacher, a rabbi, a teacher, or even a prophet. They have to see something bigger than that. They, they have to see God there. They have to see the Father acting in the Son and through the Son. And so that's, that's I think that's what we have here. Uh, that's why he says, uh, I go back to chapter 9, ver verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. So what is a sign and a miracle for us, like I, I said it again, is a work that God is doing that Jesus is doing, or that both, that both are doing. Uh, the people have asked a question. Uh, I thought that's weird that Jesus would put mud first on his eyes, and then ask him to go and wash in that pool. And there were a lot of pools around. There were dozens of pools. This is outside of the temple. It's not. It's not far, but it's right outside the temple. Jesus is in and out of the temple in these chapters. Uh, it's important, in fact, to consider that the importance of the place. The, the temple is a central place to the, to the, the heart of Jewish life. And the fact that Jesus, in John especially, does so many things in the temple is significant. Because that's, that's where he should be, <laughs> in the temple. <laughs> He's, he is the one who should be in the temple. Well, here, uh, could Jesus have, if, if Jesus wanted to, uh, could he have could he have healed this blind man even with ever without never meeting him? Could he have done that? I mean, let's suppose there's a blind man there and Jesus knows about him and Jesus is somewhere in Galilee, and then Jesus says, "Okay, I want this blind man to be healed." Did Jesus do things like that without having to be there? That's important that it's in the Bible because it's it, it has it shows us we should be very careful in these signs and miracles not to to have a too much of a physical, material understanding, you know. Oh, if Jesus doesn't put his hand, if Jesus doesn't do this, it's not going to happen. No, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the power of God that that that's not limited by space or time. Here, and we have examples of that. So then the question comes: Well, why does he have to do that? Because people think that it was required and necessary for this particular case of blindness that he had mud on his eyes. And that he wants to wash. Do you think that's what? Do you think that the mud and the washing in the pool was really what healed the man? Was that really necessary for the man to be healed? Uh, that's really a very, very uh, <laughs> a bad kind of reading and misunderstanding. And now, if that's the case, if it was not needed, if Jesus could have healed him anyway, so the point is that Jesus is not doing that so he can be healed. Why do you think he's doing that for? Is it required for him to be healed? No. So why is doing so? So the question is, why does he do that? Remember, there are people around. Every time Jesus performs a sign or teaches, there are people around. But especially, who are some of the people around that we need to be uh, uh, attentive to in the Gospel of John? His enemies. Every time Jesus teaches or does a sign or a miracle, he's in the temple or very close to the temple. Who are the people there that are watching? The priests. The high priest, the scribes, the Pharisees, watching. Could there be a message there for them and for the people around? 
is, is there something to, to learn from that? Putting mud and saying, go and wash yourself? Uh, what, what could be the lesson? Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. 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 And and you know that is true for everybody that Jesus talked to. And could talk to Nicodemus about being born of water and the spirit. Well, could could God, if he wanted to, make a person be born just like that? Into his kingdom? If God wanted to, he could do it. But it's with it's with this water and spirit. And what does water have to do with that? And then later on, you see, every time that there is a person that Jesus is involved with, like the Samaritan woman, uh, does the Samaritan woman act upon the words of Jesus? Does she do anything? I think she does. There we go. She goes and talks to the people in the village, brings them. So, you know, it's not like God is a miracle worker to the point that we're just stiff there and don't do anything. You know, God is just to zap us, you know, and we're going to be saved or what? Uh huh. Exactly. Yes. Sure. And and, the, and that's going to come out later when we read uh, later on. We're not going to be able to today. That actually the meaning of the of the healing. It's not that he, that all blind people are going to be healed from blindness. It's, it's about the spiritual. But but the point I'm trying to make is not so much that point. It's so much the, the, the fact that in the healing process, he has something to contribute to that. He has to respond. Uh, faith is, 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 is there, there is this idea of, of free choice from the beginning in, in Genesis. And you know, that's, it seems obvious for us there's free choice. We just read G Genesis 1, 2, and 3. But what we don't realize is that for the ancient people, free choice doesn't exist. You look into Hinduism, into Buddhism, into all the religions that exist, and one of the Islam the same. One of the fa fascinating thing is that this concept of the the dignity of people to choose to do what God doesn't exist in any religion. There's no such thing. I mean, like like this man. Okay, uh, he was born blind because uh, his parents did something wrong or something like that. You know, what I mean. There is, no, there is no freedom for this man. He is just, he's the victim of whatever happened to him. But with Jesus, he's not a victim anymore. And I think this idea of you have a choice, you can listen to me and your life will be changed, that's a very important concept. Because the idea that I am a victim, I can't do anything about it, that's a dangerous idea. It's not a Christian idea. Did you notice that's pretty prevalent among people who don't believe? These people who say that we don't believe in God, we don't believe really in the Bible. Did you notice that those are the most, they're the people who, who think they're the most, they don't have any choice in anything in life? They don't have any choice. Everything just happened, you know, like this, by chance or whatever. So they don't believe that they have something they can do to be part uh, of being better or getting closer to God. Or, but God gives us that uh, dignity, that value, that we can approach him. Uh, so that's what we have throughout the whole, the whole uh, encounter, every encounter in John. We see somebody either responding or doing something. Or So he tells him to go and wash. And if you notice something that is interesting too that I want to go into, I'm going to stop, is how often water is mentioned in the Gospel of John. Interesting. Why? What does water have anything to do with it? <laughs> you know? uh, well, it's there all the time. Uh, from the beginning, born of water and spirit. Samaritan woman, the water. You know, going, you know, I'll give you water. And you see that uh, here, the, the pool, the water. So it's kind of a, there quite a bit. Even there's a discussion in the beginning of John about uh, wow, the, the disciples of Jesus are baptizing more people than John. It says that in John in the beginning. And they're not, they're arguing over that. You know, uh, the disciples of Jesus are baptizing more, more than, 
the dis disciples of John. So w what's the problem with that? The question there. So we see that. Of course, there's Jesus' baptism himself. John the Baptist baptized him. So we see that that idea is there, uh, is there all the time. If you think of water in the creation account, what comes first, water or life? Water. Out of water comes life. Okay? Life just doesn't come like that. Out of water comes life. Do you think that has a spiritual meaning? Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. Yes. And in the first psalm, which is the basic psalm of all the psalms, do you see mar the water? Talking about the, the blessed is the man who doesn't sit with the mockers, who meditates on the, on the law day and night. He is like what? A tree planted by the water who brings fruit in its season, water. It's all over the Psalms, the water constantly. So water is symbol, I think water is symbol of God himself, who is the source. It's the symbol of the Torah, too, in the Psalms first. It's a symbol of the word. It's a symbol of the word of God. Uh, we, n we are dependent on water, uh, you know, to, to live. If you don't drink, you die. Uh, creation comes from water. This all shows dependence, dependence on God who is the one who created water. And, and the big issue with human beings concerning God is one word, autonomy. I want to be my own self. Modern man has a problem because I want to be my own self. I want to make my own decisions. I don't need God. I'm going to do my own thing. And I think by even telling him, putting mud and telling him to go and wash, he can see his dependence. I need to do what he says and wash. I need to listen to his word. Uh, if Jesus had just done it like that, would people have learned anything? No. There is a lesson. I mean, there's even a lot to learn from baptism. So many people think it's useless. It has nothing to do with salvation. They don't understand that there is a psychology in this. That psychology that God knows, you know, our, our psychology. It know, God knows that we need to have a response from our heart. We need to do something in order to participate in God's uh, work of salvation. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's very clear. Exactly. It's, yeah. Works. That's right. Works. And this is, and you're right, and this is not works of the law. That is a special thing that Paul deals with. But it's, it's not anything to do. Working as obeying God has nothing to do with trying to be saved by the law. And people say, well, you're trying to obey, you're trying to be baptized. That's legalism. No, that's just obeying God. <laughs> you know, that's all it is. <laughs> you're going too far with that. You know. It's not legalism just because God says, you know, you should confess uh, Jesus with your mouth. That's not legalism. <laughs> you know, that's doing what God says. Legalism is another issue. Legalism has to do with Judaism and trying to be. Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 3, if you want to be circumcised, you have to keep the whole law. But you can't do it. If you want to require circumcision from the, from the Gentiles, they're going to have to keep the whole law. They have to come under the old covenant completely. They can't do it. Not even a Jew can do it. So, that's a problem.